want to start in Chicago on December 22nd. Oops. Um, in Chicago on December 22nd, 1979, Chicagoans woke up to the news. Let me adjust this a little bit. There we go. Chicagoans woke up to the news that the Chicago Public School District, or CPS, had run out of money and was on the brink of collapse. It was the district's first payless payday since the Great Depression. And while teachers agreed to stay on the job, they warned that if the district failed to make payroll again, they would walk off, closing the schools. The district was in an unprecedented cash shortage that it had no way to solve. The trouble had started just a month ago when CPS failed to find buyers for a bond sale, a sale needed to pay off another debt coming due and to generate cash flow until property tax receipts and state aid payments um, arrived in the winter. It had fallen into the practice, along with many other school districts, of having to borrow money and pay high interest rates against anticipated revenue. Moody's Credit Bureau downgraded the district's credit on the eve of the sale, which made it unsaleable, unsellable under the state-mandated interest rate cap. And unlike in past cash crunches, bankers refused to step in with a short-term loan. The governor advanced some state aid payments early to enable the district to, pay, uh, to make payroll and make debt payments in late November and early December, but the district had been locked in a cash crisis ever since. It began missing payments to vendors, utilities, and pension funds, resulting in yet another credit downgrade and vendors starting to withhold services. Things spiraled quickly. In rapid succession, the superintendent, board of education president, and the district's top two financial officers resigned. The SEC and the state launched investigations. Revelations about years of hidden debt and creative accounting practices leaked. And a team of auditors found the book so tangled they couldn't pinpoint the size of the financial hole. They estimated that CPS needed around $100 million in cash to make it to January and somewhere in the realm of $400 to $700 million to settle all of its debts. Newspapers charted the twists and turns of the drama in daily headlines as the crisis deepened in December. Republican Governor James Thompson berated CPS for its fiscal irresponsibility and called on the city to bail out the district. Worried about the city's own shaky credit and financial situation, Democratic Mayor Jane Byrne called on Thompson and state legislators to guarantee a loan. They floated and rejected proposals and traded insults as the stalemate persisted throughout December. But everyone recognized that the payless payday marked an inflection point. Many observers thought that if the school closed, it would result in total collapse of the system, which served nearly a quarter of Illinois' children and was the state's largest employer. With this days away from happening in early January, Governor Thompson convened a summit that locked bankers, businessmen, city and state politicians, CPS officials, and union representatives in the governor's mansion for three days until they could reach a settlement. Notably, no parent or community representatives were invited to participate. The summit agreement they reached paired some short-term infusions of cash put up through the cooperation of the major participants with a plan to consolidate and restructure all of CPS's debt into a 30-year bond to be managed by a five-man appointed board of bankers and businessmen. This unelected school finance authority would also supervise the district's finances by approving annual budgets and requiring new three-year financial plans. This 30-year bond would be paid for by diverting 25% of the educational fund debt service, necessitating deep cuts in the operating budget. Coming at a time of record high inflation that was sending costs soaring and complaints from teachers and parents that CPS's educational services were already inadequate to meet student needs, these cuts over the next few years were devastating. They, pr they prompted repeated rounds of protest by teachers, parents, and community groups, and deepened already deep distrust and anger at school officials by these groups who charged that they were cutting student-facing personnel too much and the paper pushers not enough. The governor, mayor, and political and civic leaders praised the settlement as a victory for fiscal responsibility and accountability. The governor bragged it was not a bailout. Um, and wouldn't cost the state taxpayers a single cent. The cost would be borne entirely by Chicagoans, who he blamed for the crisis. The taxpayer watchdog group, Civic Federation, said the real crisis was that the board had lived beyond its means for years. And the Chicago Tribune blamed bureaucratic bloat and fat-laden and inflationary contracts with the unions as the source of the crisis. 
political, business, and civic leaders of both parties agreed that the problem had been overspending and fiscal mismanagement. The obvious solution was fiscal discipline and spending cuts. This was also the dominant narratives within public discussions during the unfolding crisis, the many post-mortem investigations and reports that followed, and in the years of school reform um, that it helped to spur and, and shape. There were dissenting voices, of course. The alternative weekly Chicago Reader blamed businessmen and bankers for causing and profiting from the crisis, saying the solution was akin to putting the foxes in charge of the hen house who'd been feasting off the poultry for years. Businessmen had been evading taxes and extracting huge profits on debt. Furthermore, some black activists and leaders blamed white politicians and voters' racism, since they had not approved a tax increase since the district had transitioned to a majority black and Latinx enrollment. As one activist charged, the schools were allowed to go to pot precisely because there are so few white children left in them. Yet, like the dominant explanations that stress school officials' irresponsibility, they identified the problem with local actors, be they businessmen, white politicians, or white voters. And as anger at the cuts deepened, many of these dissenters joined with businessmen, political leaders, and civic groups in blaming district mismanagement for the district's fiscal challenges and other woes. Critiques of bureaucracy became a rallying cry and drove three sets of major reforms over the next 20 years that sought in different ways to discipline and dismantle this bureaucracy, including an escalating set of market-based reforms to utilize incentives, accountability, and privatization. I contend that the conversation and the reform efforts that flowed from it missed important, deeper, structural causes of CPS's fiscal woes rooted in a longer history of state policies that structured disadvantage for Chicago and CPS over time in the developing metropolitan context. The dominant framing of this as a local problem and a spending one missed the significant culpability of state government in creating what was chiefly a revenue crisis rooted in a series of long-term as well as more immediate policy choices about public schooling, taxation, housing, land use, and the structures of local governance itself. The solution to the fiscal crisis tried to fix the wrong problem and was a preview of more neoliberal governance to come, including retrenchment, business stewardship, and market solutions that frame these moves as economic necessities while obscuring the many policy choices involved. This fiscal crisis, which we'll come back to, I think is an entry point into the central questions and arguments of the book. Um, which is called Structuring Inequality, How Schooling, Housing, and Tax Policies Shape Metropolitan Development and Inequality. As the title suggests, it's a history of how metropolitan inequality or spatialized racial and socioeconomic inequality was developed, institutionalized, and naturalized through a host of public policies in metropolitan Chicago or Chicagoland from the end of World War II to the early 21st century, with particular attention to the role of public schooling. And the rest of the time today, I'm going to give a big picture overview of the central questions, methodology, arguments, and narrative. And then I'm going to return to the CPS fiscal crisis to illustrate some of the analysis and claims and reflect on some of the implications of this story, including for how we think about education today. Like so many others, I was drawn to this period and this topic because I'm interested in, in inequality, including education inequality and the larger question of how and why racial inequality persisted, changed forms, and was written into the landscape of metropolitan areas, especially but not exclusively in the growing city-suburban divide. Historians have explained the causes and consequences of metropolitan inequality for decades and given us important insights about it, including the important roles that federal policies, local politics, and racial capitalism have played in structuring it over time. And historians and other scholars of education have probed the implications of metropolitan inequality, especially the city-suburban divide, for structuring educational inequality amid the era's federal equity policies. They've also explored how public school boundaries and assignment policies were used in urban planning to racially define and segregate neighborhoods, suggesting that public schools constitute another policy that helps to structure spatialized inequality. So I read and taught this work as I was finishing my first book. Um, in School, Society, and State, I explored the transformation of public education in the early 20th century as a project of national state building and social welfare, drawing in insights from American political development and law. In it, I spent a lot of time thinking about the expanding state government role in public education and how it often operated out of sight, pursuing its goals in ways that you might not expect, um, like leveraging funding and working through and often hiding behind local control. 
I also thought a lot about public schooling as an important place where social policy goals were pursued, as well as schools' role in reflecting, deepening, and legitimating larger social and economic inequalities. It made me wonder whether this scholarship on metropolitan development and fo focusing so much attention on the federal and local policy was missing an important state story. And I wondered how centering public schooling, which is legally a state policy, but is perceived and operates in many ways as local, might tell us new things. And I should be very clear that throughout when I say state, I mean the state government of Illinois and not the state in a more general sense. So I framed a set of questions about the role of state government and public schooling and metropolitan inequality over time. Oops. This is what they looked like originally. I chose Chicagoland as a site of the case study for a lot of reasons, not least of which was I had some experience in the archives there from graduate school. Um, it was attractive because it illustrated, sometimes in heightened form, the metropolitan dynamics I was interested in exploring, including municipal fragmentation, urban decline, and suburban growth, and the spatial patterning of race and class. It also had a robust history of grassroots activism and tremendous suburban diversity. As the third largest metropolitan area, it's a pretty important in its own right, but I thought it would be a good place to explore so-called de facto segregation enacted through policy that could be illustrative for other places. And I found that when I got into the archives, a far wider set of reform activities than I expected from the secondary literature, including a host of ways that reformers tried to identify and utilize institutional levers and processes to make change. I followed the sources into areas uh, that I didn't expect, like tax assessment reform, and deep into suburbs where there were more interesting and diverse stories than I expected. And as often happens in historical research, these encounters with primary sources help to shift my questions and approaches. For example, the city versus suburban story that I originally imagined became much more of a story about suburban stratification. And policy fights, uh, unexpectedly, became much more of the center of the story. Um, you're not going to hear quite as much as about the suburban stratification because of the way I've structured it around CPS, but it's in the book. Uh, so these sources, a few of which I've listed here, include the unpublished papers of dozens of individuals and organizations located in Chicago, the suburbs, Springfield, Illinois, and Washington, DC. They include the personal papers of reformers, politicians, bureaucrats, and policy experts, as well as the organizational records of nonprofit organizations, civil rights groups, neighborhood and community organizations, government agencies at every level of the federal system, and an array of religious, business, property, labor, civic, and reform organizations. They also include an array of published primary sources, including reports and research studies, newspapers, court cases, legislation, memoirs, census data, and popular periodicals. So what emerged out of many years of immersing myself in the archives and of writing and rewriting to try and make sense of what I was finding is a historical narrative about how metropolitan inequality in Chicagoland was forged, fought over, and forgotten through public policy over time that centers the role of public schooling and the state. Oops, there we go. It is a story of Chicagoland as a whole rather than the city and a couple of representative suburbs and it's attentive to trends, similarities, differences, and interconnections between places. It looks across policy domains, levels of government, local places, and time periods at both what happened and the narratives constructed to explain what happened. It's organized as a chronological story, part one, the forging of metropolitan inequality looks at the end of World War II through the early 1960s, part two, uh, fighting over metropolitan inequality, which is really the heart of the book, and you can see the most chapters, um, looks at reform efforts and policy fights in the 1960s and 1970s in school desegregation, fair and affordable housing reform, and school finance and property tax reform. Part three, forgetting metropolitan inequality, looks at the 1980s and 1990s when these policy fights were not only largely lost, but the opponents shifted, uh, succeeded in shifting the terms of the policy discourse in ways that marginalized metropolitan inequality as a problem to solve. Throughout this narrative, the book makes four primary original analytical arguments grounded in the history of Chicagoland, but which offer contributions beyond it. First, educational inequality and metropolitan inequality co-constituted one another over time. 
We're accustomed to thinking about how unequal places produce unequal schools, but I argue that the reverse is also true, that educational inequalities help to drive inequality between places over time. Education became more valuable in this period. It had greater social and economic value for families and greater significance for the value and cost of property and communities where it was locally bounded. It shaped residential choices of families in more powerful ways than ever before, businesses' decisions about location and the value and identity of places themselves. As one of and often the largest expense of local government, claiming sometimes 60 to 80% of the property tax dollar in many suburbs, public schooling played a major part in differential local tax rates and burdens. It was consequently an important consideration in development decisions, including boundaries, zoning, land use decisions that the state delegated to local places. In other words, public schooling was deeply embroiled in the suburban scramble for people, businesses, and territory. District boundaries served important dividing lines that could be gerrymandered and leveraged. Furthermore, the unequal resources and reputation of schools in such close proximity played an important role in differentiating and stratifying places over time. Good public schools, especially at reasonable tax rates because of strong property wealth, made some places far more valuable than others and made it easier for them to utilize exclusionary devices to curate high value property and services and attract more elite businesses and residents, which then further boosted property value and wealth. At the same time, districts perceived as poor quality, especially if they paid a high tax rate, became a real drag on other places making it harder to attract residents and businesses, which could result in a spiral of fiscal decline. Second, I argue that state government was a critical driver of this co-constitution in ways that most of the historical literature, which focuses overwhelmingly on the local and the federal, has missed. Legally, local governments owe their existence, organization, funding, and powers to the state. If local governments are strong, it's because state statute or the state constitution has set them up that way. Most of what we take for granted as local government is actually an express delegation of power from state government. And these are not one-time grants of authority. They require ongoing adjustment and intervention in a host of ways. The state is constantly setting the terms, for example, of how local governments get money, what they can tax, how they can do it, how they can spend the money they raise and whether they have to share any of it, whether and how they can borrow, who constitutes a local taxpayer and beneficiary, and which services are local. In similar ways, public education is constitutionally a state responsibility. Even more than municipalities, school districts, which are quasi-municipal corporations, owe their existence, form, organization, funding, powers, and responsibilities to express delegations from the state legislature and constitution. They have no power other than what is given explicitly to them. Public education, no matter how it's governed, remains a state institution under law. When we take this seriously, it recasts how we think about metropolitan areas and exposes a host of ways that things we take for granted as local and as naturally the way things are because of localism actually constitute state policy choices. Consequently, I argue that we should conceive local control of districts and municipalities not as having some static or self-evident meaning, but as a bundle of evolving state rules and policies or a state framework for localism. And I break apart some of the components of this state framework and explore how, throughout the three eras in the study, state government actors repeatedly built and defended a metropolitan system primed for inequality. I argue this state framework for localism as it interacted with the racialized value of property, incentivizes competi incentivized competition, fiscal zoning, racial and economic exclusion, and opportunity hoarding in ways that structured inequality over time. It made it easier for winners in the system to continue to accrue advantages over others and placed other localities at a significant disadvantage. State policies continually abetted, adjusted, and doubled down on the system throughout the period. They didn't just set the rules and let them operate, but were engaging in ongoing ways in the framework of local government and in these policy areas. This intervention often came through specific actions, but at other times it came from calculated decisions not to act in areas of responsibility and need. I argue that places where the state absents itself can also be important policy choices. I see taxation as playing a particularly critical role and probe many decisions and rules about it that are often taken for granted rather than recognized as the consequential distributional policy choices that they are. <laughs> 
Third, I argue the 1960s and 1970s was an important moment when a multiracial coalition of middle-class liberal reformers mobilized to name and challenge these inequalities and center them as public policy issue. I focus on the reform efforts and policy fights over school desegregation, fair and affordable housing, and school finance and property tax. Reformers leveraged policy tools and spaces opened up by equal protection litigation, civil rights statutes, federal aid and administration, and shifting public conversations about rights and equality, as well as built on the language, tactics, and energy of civil rights activism. Sometimes they took to the streets, but they often lobbied, litigated, researched, leveraged complaint processes, utilized hearings and public input processes, built nonprofit organizations, developed networks for voluntary action, and leveraged different levels and sites of government against one another. They advanced a critique about the institutionalization of racial inequality in Northern systems, its intersection, intersection with economic inequality, and the necessity of race conscious and affirmative strategies to dismantle these structures. And at the same time, they had some real blind spots, especially around the racialized nature of property and their deference to local autonomy. Reformers had some modest successes and a lot of disappointments as they faced resistance and counter mobilization from a variety of groups interested in defending the unequal status quo, including real estate and business interests, affluent suburbanites, white people across the class spectrum, and policymakers representing or sympathetic to them. There were more radical reformers at the time advancing more fundamental critiques of capitalism and liberalism. But I think there's value to studying these more incremental approaches, including their insights, strategies, successes, failures, and blind spots, which are revealing about metropolitan dynamics and the policy mechanisms of inequality over time. I also think it was largely in response to their successes or the worries that they might succeed that produced the most significant defenses of inequality and the ones that carried the day later in the century. And that leads to the fourth argument. Um, these defenders of inequality mobilized their own political pressure at the grassroots and at key sites of policymaking, as well as develop narratives to explain, excuse, and erase metropolitan inequality as a public policy problem. By the end of the 1970s, they prevailed in narrowing the pathways for equity policies and launched a counterattack to retrench and constrain social policy. I look at how defenders of inequality resisted equity reforms by, among other things, reshaping ideas of what government should and could do including by restricting public revenue and promoting a new common sense of fiscal constraint in the 1980s and 1990s. With this retrenchment of spending and expectations, policymakers from across the political spectrum embraced, for different reasons, a new set of market-based models for social policy that promised to utilize the private sector and the dynamics of the market, competition, choice, incentives, efficiency, and accountability to deliver public services in more efficient and effective ways. I argued that the shifts in what government could and should do, which changed how public policy problems were defined and the viable solutions for addressing them, constituted a kind of forgetting of metropolitan inequality that had pernicious consequences. This amnesia was especially striking in education. While using the language of equity, state and local policies rewarded and punished schools based largely on test scores, which are highly correlated with family wealth, with not enough recognition of the differential resources and contexts. Imagining a level playing field, or at least finding that question irrelevant, served to reward resource hoarding and wealth in some places and compound the disadvantages and harms for structurally disadvantaged students, schools, and communities. Of course, not everyone forgot structural inequality. Some people lived it and continued to fight. But where their critiques and efforts to challenge it had been at the center of policy fights in the earlier period, by the end of the 20th century, they could get little traction with courts, legislators, administrators, and policymakers. So I argue that the neoliberal era that we are very much still in was built in fundamental ways on the defenses of inequality, including the strategic forgetting of these earlier reform efforts that centered metropolitan inequality as an important public policy problem. So I want to return to the CPS fiscal crisis um, and situated in some of the arguments and narratives of the book, both to make it a little bit more concrete and illustrate some of the ways that I think that this history matters. First, I think the public conversation and policy solutions to the crisis, which focused on local actors and especially management failures as the chief driver of it, missed the significant ways in which it was structured by state policy choices that created a significant revenue problem. 
The book explores a whole host of ways that state policies incentivized capital flight and disinvestment from Chicago and made suburbs tax havens for affluent residents and businesses who could use state-granted land use, boundary setting, regulatory, and taxation policies to locate and protect their wealth behind suburban boundaries and channel it into their own exclusive services. In just one of many examples, the use of replacement value rather than market value for property assessment until the mid-1970s provided a major hidden subsidy for suburbanites who escaped taxation on the rising value of their homes and shifted tax burdens to others. The simultaneous and related overtaxing of property in declining city neighborhoods contributed to property abandonment and disinvestment. In addition to these more long-term state policies that impacted Chicago's revenue, the legislature, governor, and Department of Revenue made a series of more immediate education and tax decisions in the 1970s that reduced CPS's revenue at a time of unprecedented inflation and rising costs. The legislature and governor slashed state appropriations to education, underfunding the state aid formula, and pulling away millions in expected revenue from the district. They then layered on additional tax exemptions, business subsidies, and manipulations to assess valuation in ad hoc and often ill-considered ways that reduced the amount of revenue generated locally because it reduced the assessed valuation of property on which the tax was calculated. In one of the most egregious examples, but far from the only one, the legislature failed to find a replacement for the corporate personal property tax before its constitutional expiration date on January 1, 1979. This resulted in lost revenue, protracted uncertainty, and years of business tax evasion as the expiration date approached. These state actions took tens of millions of dollars of budgeted and sometimes even already spent revenue out of reach of CPS and prompted them to embrace a mix of cuts, budgetary tricks, and borrowing to make up the difference. The legislature explicitly authorized many of these budgetary tricks, like raising the debt limit or utilizing restricted funds for operating costs rather than allocating what the district needed or tapping the tremendous wealth of the state and metropolitan area. The state's refusal to aid CPS before and during the fiscal crisis is especially jarring in light of its pledge less than a decade before to assume, to assume significantly more responsibility for funding and equalizing school revenue. This is the second important thing we see when we situate the fiscal crisis in this longer history. It was a pivotal moment of dismantling and forgetting the state's commitment to redistributive reform. State legislators and suburbanites were in the midst of elevating an alternative set of policy goals and narratives, namely the necessity of tax relief and retrenchment. In 1973, in response to pressure from reformers, including lawsuits it feared would force the issue, the Illinois legislature adopted the resource equalizer. It's a fundamental change to the state's distribution of school aid to equalize district tax bases so that a given tax levy produced the same per pupil funding regardless of the district's wealth. The legislature pledged to significantly increase the state's share of funding to make it happen, tapping a newly enacted state income tax. It also set a cap on the local levy rate to limit how far some school districts could pull ahead of others. The law's goal was to reduce disparities in funding and remove the determinative effects of local wealth, as well as to relieve some burden on local taxation, which reformers insisted had grown both too high and too inequitable. While evaluation studies showed the law was making progress in meeting its goals in the first few years, things quickly fell apart in implementation for a host of reasons, including the state legislators' prioritization of other areas of spending over education and their efforts to appeal to voters at a time of rising inflation with exemptions that reduced assess assessed valuation. These made the impacts of the new school funding formula, including the local tax caps, far more punishing than intended. When combined with assessment changes that corrected generations of undervaluing undervaluing suburban property, however, it sparked a political mobilization of affluent suburbanites to gut the equalization features of the law. Um, and this is a flyer from New Trier, which is an elite um, district on the North Shore of Chicago, um, trying to rally people to lobby the legislature against the resource equalizer successfully. While they could have lobbied the state to fully fund the formula and or to cease the assessment manipulations driving so many problems, they instead asserted the right of local control to use their wealth for their own schools. First, they pushed to remove the local cap, um, and then they 
leveraged growing anti-tax discourses to adjust the formula in ways that kept more wealth from leaving the locality to support uh, education in Chicago and other places. As a result, by the mid-1980s, Illinois funding was even more inequitable and tied to wealth than it had been before the reform. So the CPS fiscal crisis came at a moment when recent reform efforts to redistribute public revenue in support of schools was being dismantled amid a defense of local control over local wealth and a rising politics of tax relief and austerity. While spearheaded by conservative activists, business groups, and affluent suburbanites, the mobilization to provide tax relief gained adherence across the political spectrum, including Democratic state leaders. They competed with Republicans for who could offer the biggest tax relief proposals, and then layered on new business and subsidies and exemptions that reduced public revenue and quietly shifted tax burdens over time. These cuts to revenue made cuts in government services and spending seem common sense and economically necessary over the next decades, obscuring the many policy choices involved, as well as fueling a heavier reliance on the private sector. The cascading cuts in the 1980s and 1990s in schools and other local public services were experienced very unequally. Affluent suburbs could tap local wealth to maintain high quality schools and services, and were far more able to leverage emerging private sector fiscal tools. While Chicago and poorer suburbs had to make deep and painful cuts in services for families with far fewer family resources, including laying off reading and bilingual education teachers, closing school libraries and programs, and in some cases even reducing the school calendar and the school day. In obscuring the policy choices, including by the state and about revenue, and denying the larger structural dimensions of CPS's fiscal crisis, state and local policymakers developed solutions that obscured and made inequality worse, which is the third thing I want to emphasize we see when we set the fiscal crisis in larger perspective. Some of participants never even discussed raising revenue to offset the 25% reduction in the operating budget, and most of them resisted a tax increase for years following it. When the new business chosen and supervised school leadership still could not find enough cuts to balance the budget amid inflationary costs, stagnant revenue, and highly needed education services, public narratives blamed the bureaucracy rather than recognizing the significant structural revenue problem and legitimate educational needs. The Chicago Tribune, for example, ran a series of articles in 1987 and 1988 lambasting CPS as the worst school system in the nation and calling to replace it with vouchers. A long teacher strike in 1987, heavily shaped by this structural fiscal problem, catalyzed public anger into demands for reform, which became the first of three major business-led reform efforts to discipline and dismantle the bureaucracy. Each escalated in its use of governance changes, privatization, and market-based strategy when the previous wave proved disappointing. The first reforms in 1988 instituted a model of site-based management that held principals and local school councils accountable for results without a single extra dollar of funding. Less than a decade later, the district swung from decentralization to mayoral control under a CEO with a background in business rather than education. He shrunk the bureaucracy by contracting out many services and imposed punitive accountability policies for students in schools in the bottom quartile of test scores on the Iowa Basic Skills Test. Low-performing students were held back a grade and low-performing schools reconstituted under the supervision of a manager, often a private contractor, who could impose radical curricular and governance changes, fire personnel, and even close a school. Less than a decade later, a third set of reforms closed dozens of public schools and replaced them with 100 quasi-privatized charter schools. These last two sets of reforms were bolstered by infusions of corporate philanthropy and business investment, all while insisting that money didn't matter and that the problem was really one of high standards and demanding results, namely the right incentives and motivation. All three waves of reform reflected a growing state and federal policy shift from redistributing opportunity to demanding results, namely minimum te student test scores, with little regard for the differential context, resources, and capacities of schools and students. This was attractive to penny-pinching state and local policymakers who had already retreated from fiscal support of CPS and insisted that higher standards and consequences alone could drive improvement. It was also attractive to affluent suburbanites who were now praised and rewarded for their academic excellence as if it reflected superior merit and effort rather than the family resources and school and community advantages they had used public policy to fight for and defend. <laughs> 
This reward had material consequences. The annual public release of an easy, comparable, supposedly objective metric of school quality enhanced schools' impact on property value and intensified its role in metropolitan stratification. This approach of demanding results in ways that saw arguments about inadequate resources or structural disadvantages as excuses wrought significant harms, especially to the most vulnerable students, schools, and communities who were subject to escalating sets of punitive, unproven reforms. It pushed students out of the system, closed schools, and shuffled students around without meaningful gains, shattered trust in community relationships, and deepened inequality within the system. Consequently, failing to see or actively forgetting the state's responsibility for and the larger problem of spatialized structural inequality had the pernicious effect of naturalizing it and making it worse. And in many ways, this is still the world we live in today, despite many scholars, including some in this room, attentive to structural inequality and many people on the losing end of it continuing to protest and fight. The dominant education policy conversations, while superficially invoking the language of equity, largely treated as a problem to solve through targeted interventions to nudge test scores, hold educators and schools responsible for student learning, or restructure failing schools. The policy solutions that gain traction are much too small for the scale of the problem. And they by and large deny, ignore, or accept as unchangeable the larger structures of inequality, including the ways that those on the winning end have used public policy to secure and protect those advantages and are deeply invested in maintaining them. It's easier to see some of these limitations and dynamics when we take the longer and wider view, including what we've lost in sidelining the problem of structural spatialized inequality and in operating within the logics and constraints of neoliberal governance. And this is where I wanna end. Thinking about the implications of this history for how we understand the past and present and think about the future. I think reformers' efforts to challenge segregation and inequality in the 1960s and 70s helps us to see the landscape of the present more clearly. Since the contours, taken for granted assumptions, and limitations of the present are easier to see in contrast to the past. It shows us some of the things we've lost, like a more robust conversation about the spatialized dimensions of inequality and the importance of metropolitan solutions. It puts in relief some of the things we might take for granted, like the narrowness of our framing of the problem and solutions in the neoliberal era. History can help us to stabilize what we think we know and push us to ask different critical questions, like to see the hidden revenue choices underneath the supposed common sense of fiscal austerity and restraint, or to see the state policies have constructed local control in ways that fuel so much inequality, but that we tend to take for granted as natural, essential, inevitable features of it rather than something we can change. And I think that history over the policy fights provides some lessons and cautions that we might learn from. I think the history here provides a deeper understanding of some of the roots, obstacles, and opportunities for policies to address structural inequality in the present, including insights about the institutional mechanisms, legitimating narratives, and um, politics of inequality over time. For example, it highlights the way that state government and taxation needs to be central reform targets. It shows that structural advantage needs to be given as much attention as structural disadvantage. And it highlights the importance of not only mobilizing grassroots pressure and finding institutional levers and sites to affect change, but also the way that narratives matter, how they explain, legitimate, and rally action, and how they define problems in ways that shape the universe of solutions that seem possible and can gain traction. I also think that this history helps us to situate ourselves in a larger story and provide both humility and critical hope. It can be easy to see the persistent, deepening inequality of education and metropolitan life is so deeply rooted and structured as to be impervious to change and to find it hard to imagine it any other way. And I suppose you could read the story that I've told here that way, um, but I don't. I think it highlights agency and contingency. The argument of the book is that these inequalities were rooted in a host of intersecting, overlapping, and sometimes hidden policy choices. And we see in the book a lot of ways that specific policy choices mattered a great deal, including places where things could have gone the other way and almost did. We see the way that policy was bent in more and less equitable directions at different moments and in ways that were impactful. Inequality has been a policy choice, and I think that it means that we can choose differently. And when I say this, I don't mean as individuals. I think the history of the neoliberal era shows us that individuals can't choose their way out of structural inequality and pretending otherwise serves to legitimate and deepen it. 
I mean collectively. This is ultimately a story about the collective choices that people make using instruments of governance and policy, and how and why those matter. And I remain stubbornly hopeful that we can develop politics and narratives to reclaim and reshape public policy to grapple with and make meaningful change in the inequality that we live with. An essential first step is to look at our present with a more critical eye, to understand how we've gotten here, what we're missing, what we, take, what we are taking for granted, and what we can learn from the past. And I hope that this book can be a very small part in doing that and towards imagining what might be possible if we made different policy choices. So thank you. And I'm, I'm very sorry about all the tax talk. <laughs> I'm also happy to talk with people at the reception that will be immediately following this out in the lo lobby. One question and then, the lo and then a reception. One question. <laughs> what sparked your interest in this topic? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I teach about this. Um, I'm a historian of education, and so this is a educational inequality and metropolitan inequality are a core theme in my teaching, and so I've been interested in it in that way. Um, I think also my experience growing up in a very middling suburb and gradually becoming more aware of inequality and stratification around me and also my blind spots about it um, gave me some interest in it. Um, and, and like I said, with the first book, um, my interest in state and local dynamics and the way that education is often legitimated while claiming to fix inequality interested me. And those things came together as I was reading this literature and made me think that there might be things that I could explore or say. Um, although as I got into the research, it is such a, a vigorous and exciting field with a lot of terrific work. It was very humbling to try and say anything original at all. Um, but hopefully, um, I have managed to do a little bit. Oh, go ahead, Ken. Go ahead, David. So these days, we are using terminology like red state, blue state, and purple state. So based on your analysis of the state-local relationship and how the state engage in compounding the problems on fiscal solvency at the local level. Do you see any potential variation among the different types of states given their political governing culture? That is, would a red state be taking a certain approach that might create certain patterns as opposed to a purple state or a blue state? Now, Illinois, of course, at the time was kind of still kind of a, it's still a blue state. But then the suburban now kind of, the suburban and the cities are quite divisive in terms of the partisan control. So that kind of suggests that there might be some kind of partisan rivalry as a set of conditions that might affect the way that the state, formally the way that they engage in local solutions. Possibly. Illinois became a blue state by the end, but through much of this period, actually, there was pretty divided control. The Senate was Republican most of the period I'm studying, um, and the House traded back <coughs> between um, Democrats and Republicans. It's a great question, Ken, but since I only studied one state, I don't really feel like I can make broader claims about what's happening in other places. <laughs> Thank you so much for the talk. It was really very comprehensive and I learned a lot. Um, I really wanted to ask you about this idea of contextualized structural inequality that you mentioned briefly, um, and also how you inherit this idea of individual agency. It's a really refreshing take and something that you bring up a lot in class, um, which is really nice because, you know, in the face of big systems and inequality of that power of individual agency is often led by the conversation. Um, so specifically, I want to really like, ask you about this point you made about what it means to look at the present with a more critical eye. Not so much from like a top-down like, policy level, but more so from that localized perspective. Um, because the reality is that like, the issue exists on the local level. It's the living experiences are at the local level. So I'm just curious about your 
Yeah. Um, when I'm thinking about taking a critical eye in the present, um, it doesn't just mean from the top down. It means kind of interrogating the things that we take for granted because we're very much steeped in a certain set of assumptions and landscape. And so that's where I think um, a longer context in both seeing the roots of things in the present and also seeing the contrast, the, uh, the other ways that things have been or could be, helps us to pinpoint some of the things that we might not even see about our own time. Um, and I, as you know from class, um, think that this issue of individual agency is really important, but I want to be really clear, as I tried to be at the end, um, that that individual agency has to be channeled in collective ways, that this isn't something, um, you know, I think that's one of the driving narratives of the last period that I'm looking at is that choice is going to empower people to overcome inequality when all it does is reinforce and legitimate that inequality. And so I wouldn't want to suggest that individuals alone have the agency to navigate and overcome structural inequality, but that, that working collectively and harnessing um, policy and governance, the tools we have to work together collectively, um, is, is what we need to do. And part of doing that is to have a critical perspective on what we're missing and getting wrong in our current moment, and especially the what we're missing. Um, and a big part of what I think we're missing, as I suggested in my many comments about tax policy, is a lot more focus on um, how we make decisions about revenue and how we distribute uh, resources that we tend to take for granted not even as policy choices, but as economic common sense or as the way things naturally are or have to be. And there's a lot of distributional choices in, embedded in that that we need to think critically about and re-examine. Are we still good with questions or should we? Oh, we, we, um, we have one question. Yeah, let's do this. Oh, we have to wrap it up. I would love to talk to people at the reception. And thank you again all for coming.